Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I haven't been to Houston for a long time, but I used to live out in Kingwood and worked in the Baytown uh, refinery running the uh, Exxon Synthetic Fuels uh, Laboratory. And uh, of course, synthetic fuels didn't happen then, but uh, by God, they're going to happen at some point in the future. What I'd like to do in the few minutes I have this morning is to talk to you about what we're going to do about peak oil. We will mitigate. We don't exactly know what will mitigate. We probably won't know until the time actually comes. So what I've tried to do is to lay out some scenarios as to how this might develop. Let's see which one is this one. Okay, when peak oil uh, uh, comes, we're going to begin to run into oil shortages. Oil shortages mean escalating prices. Uh, escalating prices and shortages are going to mean economic uh, downturn. A uh, very, very significant problem ahead. We're going to mitigate. The question is how much and how fast. And that's what the analysis is that I'm going to talk about today. I like to show simple pictures. This one shows uh, oil production and demand. Uh, increasing linearly over time. It shows that there is spare capacity, has been in the past. We're uh, now getting down to the point of having less and less spare capacity, and uh, as indicated last night, it may even have run out. Uh, at, uh, at some point uh, then, there will be uh, a turndown in, in world oil production. There will be shortages to develop, and those we will have to mitigate in various ways. The question is, how big is that uh, particular wedge that we're talking about there? I note on here the very important uh, recent uh, uh, announcement by the IEA that they expect, they didn't say peak, but they expect uh, 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 spare capacity to run out around 2012. Okay, a lot of background material here. Two points I think are of particular note. Uh, one is from the oil shockwave experiment in 2005. And uh, basically, they make the point that only a small shortage can lead to significant economic and security problems for the country. The spokesman for that, uh, as uh, I think you know, was uh, uh, Robert Gates, and he is now the Secretary of Defense. And by golly, we're seeing some interesting things out of the Department of Defense related to peak oil. The GAO study, and uh, we'll hear from uh, Mark Gaffigan uh, this, uh, this evening. Uh, he was uh, a lead in that study. They indicate a, a rate of decline after peak is important consideration because if it's a significant uh, decline rate, we have significant troubles. From our study in 2005, uh, a number of you will recall, we developed crash program mitigation. We, our interest was in defining the best that we thought the world could do, not just the United States, because this is a world problem. And we looked at technologies that were ready for implementation at that point. Implementation to work the liquid fuels problem. Very important, and sometimes people get confused that this is an energy problem. It is an energy problem broadly in the uh, century timescale, but in the very near future, it is a liquid fuels problem. Very important. We looked at what was available and we showed that there would be a delay and then there would be a growth over time of both conservation and uh, substitute liquid fuels. We had to plug that into a model for the world and the model that we assumed at that time was the uh, pattern that occurred in the United States, lower 48 states, which was well past its peak, which as you know occurred in 1970. Uh, that model, if you uh, uh, put some straight lines through uh, the usual wiggles that one sees in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the data, one can see a 2% uh, increase up until 1970, and then a 2% decrease after that, and that showed then this wedge that had to be filled. In that analysis, we assumed that uh, we didn't know the date of peaking, so uh, as this uh, graph shows, uh, we assumed that date to be zero. Okay, so the question then is, we showed this 2% growth and 2% uh, decline, and we went further in the analysis that I'm about to describe to ask, is indeed that the likely pattern, and what are the likely decline rates? Something that's very important in all of this business, and it's the thing that uh, a lot of people who think that we can fix things quick really don't realize, and that is 
that's small is huge in this business. First of all, uh, U.S. GDP, world GDP, the uh, world GDP dropped something like 3% due to the uh, uh, 1973 oil embargo, and that put the world into recession. Also, 1% of today's consumption is over 800,000 barrels per day. To save that amount of uh, uh, liquid fuels with a crash program in vehicle fuel efficiency, because we can do better with light duty vehicles, would require much more than a decade under the best of conditions. To produce 800,000 barrels of, let's say, coal to liquids in a crash program situation would cost well over $100 billion, and that number is probably low in light of what's happened recently in terms of costs, and it to take more than a decade. So small is huge. Are we working? There we go. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, the relationship between oil shortages and world GDP. We've got an analysis model we'll talk about, take a quick look at giant oil fields and how they behave. The experience in North America and Europe, I think, is uh, uh, very worthwhile noting. Look at a number of uh, uh, future forecasts, see what they have to tell us. Talk about resource nationalism, which is the wild card in this whole business, and then come up with some scenarios. Okay, first, um, world oil supply and world GDP. We need a number uh, to be able to correlate what is likely to happen to world GDP as world oil shortages develop. We have data from 1973 and 1979, but the world has changed considerably uh, since then. And indeed, there are many uncertainties and complications and unknowns. So precision in this endeavor is impossible. There's no question about it. I will show you how we came to a conclusion that the percent change in world GDP divided by the uh, percent change in world oil supply is about unity. What that is, that is an order of magnitude number. That's not an exact number. It is not 10, that would be too large and it is not 0.1, that would be too small. So something a half to two in that range is probably what's likely. This picture shows world GDP from uh, 1986 to uh, 2005 and world oil production, and you see that they, the two tracked very well. Deutsche Bank calculated this ratio that we're looking for for that period of time when there were no shortages. This is on the plus side of the ledger. And that uh, indicated a ratio of uh, about 2.5. Others use uh, 2.0 and so forth. The point is, it's of order unity. OK, if you look at 73 and 79, where we had inflation, higher unemployment, growing unemployment, uh, recession, and high interest rates, uh, the US GDP, this is US now, uh, dropped by 3% in both cases. Oil supply was off by 4% and 5% in the two cases. You have to be very careful because of periods of times and lags and so forth. Again, this is an approximation. So the ratios there were 0.7 and 0.8, which ends up being of the order of unity. If you look at what Oil Shockwave came up with and the analysis that they did where they were concerned not about peaking, but uh, severe problems associated with terrorism, they saw a 4% uh, global oil shortfall leading to oil prices of the order of $160 a barrel and the U.S. going into recession and millions of jobs uh, being lost. Uh, again, if you look uh, carefully there, the, uh, the ratio is about unity. Again, Robert Gates involved there along with a number of very other distinguished people. Okay, so let's develop a model. Uh, a number of things are kicked around in this business, as I think you all understand. One is the sharp peak, which looks like what I showed you earlier, namely a, uh, an increase to a sharp break and then a decline. In uh, a number of forecasts, you see a rollover and a roll down, and in other cases, you have people talking about and showing plateaus. So those are the patterns that we're going to deal with. A model that fits in that particular case is shown here. You're looking at oil production vertical axis as a function of time, uh, oil uh, production uh, increasing until there is a trend break, and then you go into a period of plateau after which you go into a period of decline. 
the width of that plateau is very important because it certainly will not be uh, without fluctuation. So that's an important parameter in the, the problem that we're going to deal with. If you collapse the plateau and have a rollover and roll down, and you pick a number for what we'll call a pseudo plateau, you have a plateau-like period where things are changing more slowly than they were on the upside and the downside. And so that represents a special case of the model. Let's look at giant oil fields and what happened. This, of course, uh, is Prudhoe Bay, and uh, uh, many of you are familiar with what happened there. Oil, uh, by the way, interesting story. Harry Jameson was the uh, geologist, and he was uh, a senior person at, uh, at ARCO, and uh, they were ready to fold up and leave. And Harry said, let me drill one more well. And they did. Harry did good after that. Uh, what happened uh, is oil production increased, reached the maximum, which was determined by the capacity of the pipeline, and then went into decline and has been in steady decline ever since. If you look at the reasonably well-managed giant oil fields in the world, ones that were not in places that had political revolution or managerially screwed up badly, uh, if you look at a number of those, you see the kind of decline rates that are shown here which range from 8 to 16 uh, percent. That's a limiting case. I don't expect, and I think very few people would expect, decline rates to be that, that large. But it is kind of a marker as to what could happen. Let's look at North America and Europe. Uh, first of all, there's uh, North America, and in particular the lower 48 states. I showed you the pattern earlier of 2% uh, uh, increase until 1970 when we peaked, and then a relatively sharp peak, and we went into decline at about a 2% uh, per year decline rate. So there's one of our patterns. If you look at what happened in Europe, and Europe, like all of North America, was reasonably well managed according to free market uh, principles uh, without major interruptions or uh, distortions uh, due to politics. If you look at Europe in particular, you see that uh, they went along and uh, their, uh, their oil uh, production increased to about 1996, and then they had a period of plateau, which was about a 3% variation. Now think back to what I said before, 3% variation, 3% shortage, 3% uh, uh, problem in world uh, GDP. At the end of that period, it went, they went into a 5% decline, and that's what they've been doing since. That's a plateau example. Another peak and plateau example is what happened in North American liquid fuels production. There was a rise to what is considered, ought to be considered, a very sharp peak. There was uh, then a, a decline rate of the order of 3% per year for a total of 15% decline before North America went into a plateau period, and in this case, it was a 4% variation over a significant period of time. Now, one can dig into both cases and understand exactly what happened, and uh, one can uh, then uh, correlate that with what might happen in the world. We haven't done that. That's to be done by somebody in this audience, I hope. Okay, summarizing then the patterns of uh, what we saw there, uh, the sharp break in five-year decline, sharp break uh, in North America, 15% decline. If we were talking about a 15% decline in world GDP, we'd be talking about very, very, very serious trouble. The plateau case, uh, we had uh, six years and 16 years of plateau, and uh, then, and, and that was a three to four percent width, and then the decline phase in these cases was three to five percent. Keep that in mind and think back to what a p impact that might have on world GDP. Okay, a number of folks have made forecasts, and I'll show just some of those that are representative. Uh, Colin Campbell uh, in the, uh, uh, the graph on the uh, left-hand side shows a break occurring uh, after a relatively steady uh, increase to 2009, a peak 2010 to 2011, uh, and then a 2% decline rate after the rollover occurs. 
There's approximately a four-year pseudo-plateau in that period uh, uh, with a 4% um, uh, uh, for a 4% uh, uh, bandwidth uh, uh, decl uh, decline. If you look at uh, what L John Le Herrera uh, shows, he shows a break in 2010, a much more gentle rollover and of the order of eight years uh, uh, going into then a 2% decline. So we've taken the 4% rollover decline as a pseudo quasi uh, uh, pseudo plateau uh, and that would of course lead to a significant but uh, relatively moderate recession. And uh, uh, so that's, that's how we're looking at these slow rollover uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, Chris Zabrowski, who's going to talk to you uh, very shortly, uh, shows this a maximum around 2010, 2011, a break in 2009, uh, three years to a 4% uh, decline in the rollover that, uh, uh, and roll down that uh, uh, could be pulled out of his data. Uh, Friedrich Robles in uh, University of Uppsala did a number of different cases looking primarily at uh, giant oil fields and came up with uh, decline rates, plateau in one case, uh, sharper and sharper uh, uh, rollovers in each case, and decline rates there uh, ranging from two to four and a half percent, and I'm sorry the slide slipped a little. And CERA uh, indicates uh, a, uh, a growing uh, production to a plateau in 2030. I communicated with Peter Jackson on this. Uh, he says their data is good up until 2030. They think a plateau will occur after that and so they kind of draw it in. So that shows you their view of the world. Okay, if you take these pseudo plateaus and the decline rates as indicated by these various forecasts, you see what's shown here. Uh, you can scan through that very quickly. Uh, six years, uh, 15 years, uh, five years, and varied uh, period of plateau or effective uh, pseudo plateau uh, uh, for uh, uh, Friedrich. Uh, and decline rates then of two up to uh, 5%. And uh, CERA, uh, as uh, Peter said, did not uh, uh, go into detail about the plateau. They just expect that that will occur, and they didn't forecast a decline rate. Okay, a summary then of uh, what comes out of looking at these forecasts is as indicated here. These pseudo plateaus is indicated by that little box with the uh, rollover roll down, uh, a width that we assumed of the order of 4%, which seemed reasonable based on uh, what we had uh, seen earlier for what actually happened in, the Euro in Europe and the United States, and that can last anywhere from two to 15 years. Decline rates, two to 5% a year after that. Okay, now the wild card, resource nationalism. We're all well aware of the fact that uh, uh, things have been changing dramatically over recent decades. Uh, if you go back to 1950 or 19, uh, uh, shortly uh, thereafter the Second World War, uh, the national uh, oil companies were relatively modest in terms of control of world oil and the international oil companies, the Exxons, the Chevrons, Texacos and so forth, uh, basically were the, uh, the big kids on the block. Over time, and this is strictly notional, that's not an exact graph, we get to the situation like uh, uh, that exists today, and that is the national oil companies have taken over and control the majority, the vast majority of the oil in the world. Those folks have different agendas than the international oil companies, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So the major players now are Saudi Aramco, uh, the National Iranian uh, Oil Company, Pemex, uh, Petrobras, Luke Oil, and so forth, and you can develop a long list. The diminished players, and in the, the term baby oil uh, came from Red Cavani, who is the, uh, uh, the president of the American Petroleum Institute. Uh, the Exxon that we love to uh, hate every time that there was a problem, in fact, is a very small player in the world now as uh, is Chevron, BP, and so forth. So very significant companies with very significant cash flows and, uh, and money, and they will play significant roles in the future, but they are now small. The American public is gonna have a fit when they can't blame Exxon. Okay, the uh, international oil companies were profit-oriented uh, uh, for their stakeholders. They were well-managed. Uh, generally, they were technologically strong, they were efficient, they were transparent, uh, they had long time horizons, and they were 
good, solid corporations. They screwed up along the way, like any of us do, of course, but they were, by golly, very sound operations. The uh, national oil companies, on the other hand, uh, owe their allegiance to uh, their capital and to uh, their president or whoever, uh, their emir, whoever it may be. Uh, bringing cash out of the business is important in many cases. Uh, some have very poor management, uh, low reinvestment, which is something that the IEA has worried about, very short time horizons, and in fact some are financially very weak. Okay, the reality is that there's more people at ASPO USA conferences, as Steve indicated, and there are more people paying attention to peak oil, but peak oil has not yet passed into a major uh, factor in public and governmental thinking in most places in the world. It hasn't crossed that threshold yet. My feeling is that the situation will be that there will be a panic when people begin to realize that this is a terrible, terrible, terrible problem. That's basically what happened in 1973 and 79. The announcement came, there was still plenty of oil, but Many people, all of us maybe, many of us, went out to fill up our tanks and uh, put some uh, gasoline or other fuel in shortage, and by God, we sucked the system dry, and shortages appeared right away because of panic. For oil exporters, when people begin to realize that this is a problem, I believe that oil prices will increase dramatically from where they are now, the good old days will be uh, $90 oil, uh, and these oil exporters will have another major windfall. Some of them are likely to reduce their exports. Why shouldn't they? If you were Mr. Putin, who's already written a doctoral thesis on this very subject, uh, if you were an emir in the Middle East, um, You've got a lot of money coming in. You don't really know what to do with all that money. You've got a resource which is being depleted. Um, a number of those folks are very likely to cut back on their exports. And I call that oil exporting withholding. If you were involved, if it was your responsibility in your country and you were reasonably concerned about the well-being of your people, then I suspect most of you would hold back in a situation like that. But for the rest of us who are importers, we got problems. So the notional picture, and I like to put up these notional pictures, is uh, looks like this. World oil production, if it was a geological limit, might look something like the rollover that the forecasters talk about. But this oil exporting withholding scenario, OEWS, Indicate, would indicate that the, the exporters would withhold oil from the market and peaking would occur at an earlier date. IEA, of course, as was indicated uh, last night, has begun to talk about these problems. They said that um, the increase, the surge in uh, funds that have gone into oil and gas investment are uh, illusory, uh, primarily because the cost of everything has skyrocketed. And they say real investment in 2005 was barely higher than the year 2000. That's not a good sign. Future is unsustainable, remarkable to come out of a political body like IEA, and we are doomed to failure. We're on a course for an energy system that will evolve from crisis to crisis. I don't understand how this didn't make the front page all over the world. Anyway, uh, Excess uh, capacity and demand are converging and peaking, which is effectively what they're saying would be 2012, and the reason for this is the national oil companies and their behaviors. Okay, so let's then come up with our uh, scenarios. The original pattern shown on the left-hand side, sharp peak, a rollover, and a plateau. The, the, uh, out of that and from this analysis, we come up with three planning scenarios. The very best one, the first one is a plateau case. The second one is a middling case, That's, I call it a middling case. It is a sharp break like occurred in North America. And the worst case is we're headed towards a sharp break and oil exporters begin to hold back. That's shown here, plateau might be two to 15 years. Decline rate of two to 5%, that's the range, what we saw. Middling case, sharp break, two to five percent again. 
Worst case, a, a, a decline rate faster than 2 to 5 percent, and as you think about that and world GDP, it's a, not a very pretty picture. So let's go back and take a look at what we did before. Uh, a number of you remember uh, uh, this picture of what could be done on a crash program basis, the most optimistic that we could conceive that could happen in the world. That kind of a pattern. A delay, then rapid growth. The question we raised then was, can mitigation overtake oil decline? All right, let's put that together into two different pictures. Uh, in this particular case, we're looking at crash program mitigation. Let's assume, because we're doing an approximation, that we get to 100 million barrels a day. We have a 2% decline rate. It's shown in the heavy blue line there. And in comes our crash program mitigation, which is started at the date, at the date of uh, uh, the decline. Uh, it shows what the shortages would be, and with our correlation, world GDP might look like that. If we have a 5% decline rate, we're talking about a very rapid drop, and again, going back to our correlation, we're talking about a extraordinarily serious world GDP problem. In summary, remind you, you I think all know this, that small percentages represent uh, huge impacts in this whole business. I'd remind uh, again because of some things that were said uh, yesterday, this is a liquid fuels problem. This is not an energy problem. Windmills are not going to run the cars that we have now and the machinery that's out there that represents uh, 50 to 100 trillion dollars uh, worth of investment. That isn't going to change quickly and electric power isn't going to all of a sudden run our, our vehicles and our trucks and uh, airplanes and so forth. Uh, percent short, uh, a reduction in uh, uh, world oil supply about equal to percent reduction in world GDP. Uh, there will be uh, uh, maximums that can occur either sharply or, uh, but in all cases they'll be followed by decline. Resource nationalism is the wild card in this business and it is essentially, I believe, unpredictable. We came up with three cases, a best, a middling, and a worst. Plateau, if we're lucky, if we're really lucky, that would be good. As people begin to plan on what they do with their personal lives and uh, hopefully what government begins to do in planning uh, on what happens after uh, peak oil, uh, you have to uh, choose how you'd behave in each of these three cases. And then the last slide, the more you think about it, the uglier this business gets. Thank you very much.